it's pretty awesome to actually see the crowd you're talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, this is the one that was going to go up to the aquarium in Sarasota, but our operations director Allison, the one giving the tour, yeah, yeah. she got so attached attached that now he's it's kind of the mascot. She calls him Big Red. Oh, oh wow. And that's a big male. And you can see that their claws are actually adapted to algae. They're not they're not adapted to cutting and ripping and tearing flesh. They're really and what's very gentle. Oh wow. Yeah. So that's why it's kind of almost like a almost know, like a horse hoof. Yeah, like a spin yeah. Else, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they've got very, okay. very specific dentition. He's not happy Sorry. about it. Yeah, he'll be all right. And then so I suppose all the crops right to have two pincers. This only has one. Well, he yeah. should have two. Oh. He lost he lost one of his claws and you know somehow. Um, and when they're when they're younger, especially they'll they'll actually molt. Every time they molt, they'll grow a new limb back. Cool. So he's also missing one leg here yeah. so they should have 10 you know one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so he lost a claw and a leg on this side he's been to the mill yeah yeah, yeah he's a he's Thirsty. an ornery fella yeah well, and they're uh, no oh it's like the science fiction it looks an alien i just want to say that yeah yeah, yeah. they're really really interesting critters <laughs> wow. Yeah, and this is a big male. They get these big claws, and and they've got this very kind of phallic abdomen here. The females actually have this abdomen spread across the entire yeah. ventral surface, and basically what it is is like a lobster or a shrimp, where they have. All right, where they have a, um, a tail, their abdomen, this apron on crabs is that abdomen wrapped around underneath them. So same kind of same kind of segmentation as a lobster tail or a shrimp or anything like that. And then the pleopods, the little swimmerettes underneath the lobster's tail are, are inside here as kind of filamentous bits and pieces. Go ahead and let him go back into the water. These ones are all females that he's mated with in the last couple of weeks, really. Um, and they're all brooding eggs. Yeah, there's a couple of um, babies over there that you're in love Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every one of these tanks, all the way to the very last one, is all it's new juveniles. Baby, yeah. These guys Lots are the mamas for most of them. Yeah, they're smaller. The females tend to be smaller. See how the apron is all the way across the bottom? And, and their no claws problem. are small. They get to be more of a menace than, than the males most of the time. And it's really not their claws that you worry about so much. Like, she'll, she'll get a hold of me here in a second. It's not so bad. But these dactyls, yeah. they'll, they'll Stop. dig into you and rip and tear. But you can open this up and actually see the clutch oh, no, of eggs. Uh, yeah. So these are brand new eggs. As um, as they develop, they'll go from kind of a red color to Whoa. to a uh, brown, almost gray. And as the co as they change color, we'll um, we'll know when to shut water off so that we get get all the larvae. Wow! Uh, I gotta probably get her back in. Crab, crab, you are. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> and we can actually get them to eat algae really easily. I'll grab some of this. This is some of that. That's what's so exciting about these guys is this is Dictyota, the really nasty, chemically defended, disgusting stuff that fish herbivores actually avoid. And it's got this kind of characteristic, thin, Y-branching kind of morphology to it. And you can imagine how... Ugly the weavers in the block, right? Just this over the place. Oh yeah, it's all of this a, comes from thing. outplant sites like where we remove it. Yeah. Whereas when we put it in with these guys, 
Mm. See, well, I just I just messed with her, so she might not cooperate, but she should freak out about something, and then she'll grab some of this. Get away from it. Yeah, she's she's a little agitated. I'll see if I can't get one of the other ones to actually eat it. So there's Dictyota and I want to say Labophora, one of the other nasty ones. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, it's hungry. They they there? grab it and just eat it right up. Oh. Yeah, her too. Proof of concept, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you can actually tell how long they've been in these tanks, the juveniles. This is the youngest one, next youngest by like two days, next youngest by, you know, two days, yeah. next youngest by two days. And you see, we, we let the tanks get really foul because they tend to settle better. Yeah. But as you progress through the number of days that they've been there, and then these are the oldest ones, there's less and less and less algae because they're just, they're just decimating it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Feeding them actually becomes... Harder. The hard part, yeah. Culturing algae is going to be a bigger part than culturing the crabs. They're pretty, pretty easy. So each of these, dots. each of these little white dots is a juvenile crab, and they're all kind of all the way, all the way around now, and then across the bottom as well. Same thing in here. Same thing in here. And you see, those are a little bigger. These are actually about six weeks old. This one's maybe a week and a half or so. There's actually quite a bit of molts, so they've been growing like crazy in here. But you can see some of them up on the up on the wall. They actually start to look like crabs. Yeah, your lab assistant said that like roughly there's a 75 percent kind of excuse me 75 percent loss. So there's just one over a thousand, and then just 250. Uh, this one where we got 250 was was probably was that screw ups on on our end. In here, we're we're losing far fewer than that. Um, how much you typically? How many? How many survive typically? Uh, let's say a thousand. We'll let you know in a couple of weeks. Oh, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, not many folks have really gone past this stage. Oh, really? Um, so this at least in the last twenty years. You know, you know, before that, they were using these as a food fishery. You know, food a seafood commodity. Um, like, because those guys are very palatable oh, okay. better than right. <laughs> better than snow crab better than yeah really? like, like really really good um <laughs> but growing them out to that size is kind of a, a pain in the butt growing them out to the the small size that we need for restoration easy peasy about three to six months and you know these guys are at six weeks and they're already about 30 percent of the way that they need to go to get ready for out planting um, but yeah, I, I would say based on, based on this progression, we're losing about 30% of, of what settles, which is not bad at all when we're talking about a clutch and that's in a 10 gallon tank with no water flow, right? So the, all the, all the water flow is not in there. They're static tanks. This system is going to change some of that. So we'll even get better survival. Um, so is this species, so like, if we come to be right and right, and we're kind of just like, in, there's a lot of them right to go quickly to that type of thing, right? They're almost like insects, right? In the way that like, you can kind of oh, yeah. do some super fast. Yeah, almost, is almost that, are selected. Yeah. Are, old, um, are old crab like that, or is this particular species? Um, most, no. most crabs are that way. Most crabs, you know, they don't, there's not a lot of parental care yeah. after they hatch. Or, or, or if any, yeah. um, and most of them try to do kind of a predator, predator swamping, where they, they produce so many larvae that just a few are going to make yeah. it through, and all they need is for one or two to make it through to persist, right? So um, most most or all spider crabs are kind of that way, where they're they're producing a lot of eggs relatively frequently. Um, they hatch at night to try and avoid a lot of predators of the larvae. These guys are unique, or not unique, but they're they're partly unique in that their whole larval stage is 
three to five days. So they, they go from hatch to this stage in about three to four to five days, wow. which is nothing amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they settle. They, they actually go through the actual larval stages and then settle into a megalopa in less than a day. So about 18 hours. So they only have to survive a day and a half, you know, two thirds of a day or so as part of the plankton. And then they can settle and start hiding in rock and things like that. And a lot of a lot of the reason that you don't see a lot of the crabs, you can see them kind of standing up on that yeah. rock. They'll get into that complex structure and you'll never see them again until they get, you know, much bigger. So, um, so kind of discuss the the range of this specific crab, right? Also, you kind of mentioned how they're really palatable, right? So, has there been a historic issue with overfishing of these crabs? No, no, not many people know about them. Oh, they're good. nocturnal, which is, works in their favor. So they come out at night. They're herbivores, so you can't really trap them, right? Yeah. So, so they've they've been pretty pretty well insulated from fishing pressure. At least in Florida, you know, further south in the Caribbean, like in uh, Belize and, and parts of Mexico, fishermen are getting more money for these than they are for lobster. Really? And, and in restaurants, this is able to sell for twice or three times as much as a lobster dish. Wow. Um, so so there's, a, there's a very strong fishing pressure in some parts of the Caribbean, but, but they're relatively low abundance. So, so they're hard, you know, few and far between, and they're hard to come by. They're hard to fish for. Um, unless you know exactly where you're going, you know, unless you have some spots. Um, and then they're very easy to overfish. You know, if you, if you start taking the, the adults out, very few of them make it from this stage to this stage, you know, in nature. So they're, they're very easy to overfish, which kind of leads to one of the, one of the, you know, kind of theoretical constructs for using these for reef restoration. Once they get, when they're in these juvenile stages, obviously they're they're eating algae like crazy, and it doesn't matter if they're big or small. They're eating an enormous amount of algae. If we can set up a system where we're doing stock enhancement of juveniles, they're serving that ecological role. But once they get morphologically mature, once the males molt and get those big claws, they start getting antagonistic towards one another. They they kind of set up territories, and basically that density of crabs that you want on a reef starts to disperse because of those interspecies, yeah. yeah, interspecific yeah, it's a competition. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at down in, in South America, in Mexico and Belize, is get fishers in on their culture and, you know, establish a territory where that's your fishing area, and you just take thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these crabs out, mow down algae, and then once they get big and start fighting with one another, kill them and eat them. Yeah, so so open, basically open range sea ranching, where you're you're putting back an animal to serve an ecological role. You're also seeding your own fishing ground, and you're continually replacing what you're taking. So you're, I mean, literally, you know, in theory, sustainable. So there's there's a whole bunch of other things that we need to look at before we get Make an assessment, yeah. to that point, but. It's it's very promising. We've we've run these experiments here in Florida, and we had phenomenal results um, in Mexico, and we had kind of good results. And in Belize, the experiments failed so far, um, but we're we're getting ready to ramp that back up next month. So, so what's it's the range very range? promising? What's that? So what's the range geographically? Is it just the Caribbean? Oh gosh, uh, there are reports of them all the way up into North Carolina, Virginia ish. And then all the way down to the north coast of Brazil. Okay. So, so all throughout the Caribbean region, all throughout the Gulf of uh, um, Gulf of Mexico, and then all off of the eastern seaboard of the United States up to you know kind of that Carolinian limit. So they're just big bay. That's not quite yeah. that far. I mean, but like right there. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mentioned that because it's like a, I know they have a huge algae problem. Right? Like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, their algae problem is really a, a microalgae, so so oysters and seagrasses yeah. are going to help solve that. And they're they're working really hard on restoration up there. I actually did my my PhD at uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, right on the Chesapeake Bay. Cool. Um, and yeah, there's there's quite a bit of stuff there. Worked with another crab up there, the blue crabs. Yeah, the, yeah, I love them. The most 
evil species of animal on the planet. Oh yeah, they're just foul-tempered animals. Oh, yeah, they're Oh, we'll yes. definitely get back on my evil right? Oh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we grew up eating them, but there's. I mean, now there's so, you know, overfishing issue yeah. there. But uh, I definitely like working with these guys a lot better. The, the blue crabs are a lot prettier. Yeah. Um, and more interesting in mesocosms and things. They're very interesting behavior. These guys kind of just sit there and eat. Yeah. yeah. Many fewer cuts on my hands from, from these guys. That's fine. <laughs> I think these are interesting. You know, if you were to come back in three or four weeks, this would be a very different place. You know? Yeah. But no, I think that, that kind of captures what we're doing. I mean, this is all part of Mission Iconic Reefs. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. It's the largest restoration program on the planet right now wow. where NOAA and um, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary have put together this demonstration effort that to, to basically demonstrate full force restoration on seven of the iconic reefs up and down the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary um, where they're pumping in somewhere on the order of 100 to 300 million dollars over the next 20 years and, and putting out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of corals, kind of restoring an area equivalent to, you know, many, many, many football fields of, of coral reef habitat and doing it in a scientific way. And the vast majority of it is taking brood stock like this, chopping it up into micro fragments, growing it out and putting it out on the reef to restore coral cover to a meaningful level, you know, going from 2% on the reef to like 10 or 15 or 20%. Well, and I think the end goal is 25% coral cover. So it'll be, you know, what, what people were seeing back in the eighties and seventies and eighties on, on the reef track here. But another integral component of it is introducing grazers. This is one um, Josh Patterson at the um, at UF and, and the Florida Aquarium are really working hard on diadema, the long spine sea urchin, as not competing herbivores but complementary herbivores. So, so using both species to facilitate the survival and growth and recruitment of these guys. Um, so, I, I would definitely um, they've got a they've got a whole a whole series of um, outreach materials that you can check out on online and and it goes through the whole program but these guys specifically are part of that part of that plan and that's literally what these two raceways and that rack and that rack and and the system that'll be where you guys are standing right now are all working towards is, is supporting mission iconic reefs the, the i mean biggest restoration initiative in history well it's like i definitely need to do some research on them and maybe reach out to a couple of people over there yeah yeah absolutely one thing i really appreciate is it's like you know i think it's so easy to kind of get caught in the whole doom and gloom kind of side of conservation being awesome it's like you know throughout the course of the day it's like you know it's been a lot of hope right and it's like uh you know it's a breath of fresh air to kind of just see like hey like you know things are bad but if we work hard enough and we kind of put in work, things get a hell of a lot better. So I really appreciate that. Exactly. Know? And and that's, you know, so there's a there's an argument out there that there is a lot of toxic positivity, which I don't I don't buy into. They're, they're saying that people are giving too much hope in a hopeless situation. And it and it leads to drops in funding because you don't meet these restoration metrics that really that really are things that give people, you know, reason to continue contributing financially or, or legislatively to these efforts. And, and I would argue that it's the exact opposite. There's too much doom and gloom and, and, you know, that making, making it sound and, and trying to portray it as a hopeless situation is, is the worst thing that we can do. I mean, for the public and for our legislators, it's like, well, if there's no hope, we should walk away. And that's not the case. I mean, there is hope. There is, there, are, there are ways to reverse and and adapt to a changing environment such that we preserve the form and function, or at least conserve the form and function of these ecosystems. And and this is one of them. This is one of them. Um, Celia's lab over here, where they're doing sexual reproduction stuff and looking at different, you know. 
adaptive traits and increasing the genetic diversity of the, the coral community that we're putting back out. These are all ways that we can address the impediments to restoration. And, and as we make you know small experimental out plants and we fail at things, we identify bottlenecks and then we can attack those with scientific investigation and try to address them and move forward. So it's, you know, I, yes, I'm glad that you brought that up. The, the, the doom and gloom thing is definitely, definitely valid. I mean, yes, there's a big problem and it's not going anywhere, but letting that drive your, your way forward is a, is a sure way to go, you know, to giving up. Well, to me, I mean, the way I interpret it, you have two options, right? Either do something with a you know, with the possibility of failure or do nothing with the guarantee of failure. Yes. Right, and it's like, I want to do something, you know, and it's like, hell, I mean, you fight until you can't anymore. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And, that's, and that's science, you know, like uh, Edison found yeah. 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb before he got one of them that did, that's right? Really and it's the it's same way, yeah. you know, you know, and, and well, while I was a professor, it's very hard to convey that to students. You know, if I get the wrong answer, if I don't, if I get zeros in my data, no, 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 those are valid, that's data, that's what happened. You report that, that's science. You find a whole bunch of things that don't work before you find a few that might, or the few that drive you in the direction of the one or two or 10 or 50 that do. So that's, that's part of what we do here. And, and the restoration community tends to have that very, very positive, uh, engaged outlook and it's and it's kind of rough you know hearing constantly in the news and and from from other researchers how how dismal and and you know abysmal our chances are and you know that's great we can do about it. but we're seeing what's going yes exactly you know well, I mean, I find a solution yeah. well I think we have to get going I really appreciate your time Dr. Spadaro thank you